So thank you, uh, Ray, for that introduction and for inviting me and um, giving me the chance. Uh, we've had a really interesting uh, and will mix of people, Joel and John, who are on the firing line, and a lot of academics. And I've gone back and forth across that line. So I'm going to try to occupy that space in the middle, probably satisfying no one. But that's what <laughs> I'm going to try to do. Um, it's important to say that now that I am back on this side of the line in the university, what I'm going to tell you is my take on what happened. But this is certainly not what the department would necessarily say. Um, and so it's just my view of what we tried to do. Um, I'm going to take off from almost the point that Larry's question, I think, left things, which is, um, is it possible to think about, at least in the short term, before we get to 80% dismissals of teachers after their first year, is it possible for public schools, uh, in a sense, to emulate whatever it was that Caroline Hoxby was finding in the charter schools in New York City that do seem to be doing better. And every bit of data we have, we group all of our schools in, in New York City, we group them all, have grouped them by all of these different categories to see which categories of schools get the best grades on our progress reports. And, in, and invariably and with, um, uh, with no question and by a large margin, the charter schools as a group outperform all of the other groups that we can think to create. It's not that they all do, there's variation there. But, um, so the, the, the goal here is to think about whether, at least in the short term, before we find a way to scale charters to all be able to reach all kids or all of the kids who need them, or before we can get to a point where we can manipulate how we get teachers into the classrooms to the point where we're getting these big effects. We've got a million and one kids in New York City, obviously many million more across the country. What do you do in the meantime? And the other point here I think that's important is that we don't know exactly what that meantime means. One interpretation I think you could make of what um, Caroline's study uh, demonstrated uh, or demonstrate is that there may be something to that concentration of high motivation um, kids um, and, and in charter schools. And we don't want to fool with that. We don't want to take away that part of the model because that would just be to say, don't do what you do well so you can do something else. So it may be that we really don't know how to scale um, charters all the way up to 100% um, or whatever percent it would take to get to the students who are not being um, educated like they need to be, the students that Joel was talking about in his um, remarks. So the idea here is how can we do this? And, and this is a, just a very simple way of trying to figure out what it is the charters, the good, the charters that do uh, relatively well are doing. And I wouldn't say that this is exactly a summary of what Caroline said, but this is one view that you hear a lot, which is you're trying to move from a situation where you have um, a lot of uh, obscurity about what's happening because there's an effort either to hide failure or to excuse failure by blaming it on all sorts of things. And that's the culture of schools. And trying to move it to a place where the educators essentially feel like they're going to be really clear about what the outcomes for kids are, and they're going to feel responsible for those outcomes, child by child. Uh, and the idea being there that once you've made that judgment, um, then you're ready to try to move those kids forward because you feel very responsible for what has kept them from uh, doing well. And so what we've thought about, one of the ways of understanding what New York has tried to do, and as I say, this is my take, not everybody would put it this way, is trying essentially to um, get um, a public system, if it can't be all charter or replicate charters, to emulate charter schools in some way or another. And so what this very dense slide that will get some general in Afghanistan very mad at me about the PowerPoint um, is trying to do is to talk about the different kinds of transformations that you need to make. And I think we spend a lot of time uh, talking about the transformations at the school level. I'll talk about that too. Obviously, that's the most important. But I do want to also spend a little bit of time pointing out that there are big transformations that need to happen in the central bureaucracy, big transformations that need to happen in the intermediate spaces between schools and 
um, uh, the center, or I don't think that <coughs> schools will make these changes. Um, this is again a time to just revisit that question if there's this much complexity. If you think about it, what charters are trying to do is get rid of the center and get rid of the intermediate structures and get rid of politics and you know, kind of go from there. And so you might ask if we have to deal with all of this kind of change, why wouldn't we instead think about moving to all charters um, as quickly um, as we can? And the only things that I will say there is the same thing. In the meantime, we've got to do something for the kids that we have, and we can't wait. We've waited too long. And I don't think that there are particularly good models yet for taking um, these uh, to scale. And so I would say, why not have both schools, sets of schools, try to migrate essentially to the same point and meet at some point um, partway there? So that's what um, this is about. Um, so first of all, and, and the final point then that I think is worth ma making on this is that there is evidence that the kinds of things that Joel was talking about actually are having effects. Now, all of these effects include charter school effects, and they're probably pulling things up. So I don't want to, but there are effects that are taking place across the rest of the system that are quite promising, um, if not necessarily uh, by any means where we want to go. So just to look at this very quickly, this is New York City from 2002 when the mayor came in. Some of these changes I'm going to talk about started happening to um, 2009 when we last had the, uh, the tests uh, for the year, the state tests. And essentially the top line just asks how many kids in New York City are at proficiency in English language arts on the left and in math on the right, and you see gains. So that's a good thing, um, particularly because that slide um, Joel showed you, which is a a, a small amount of change in your proficiency at eighth grade if you are around three, that is if you're in the middle space, a small amount of gain in proficiency adds up to a big gain in the percentage, the proportion of those kids who will graduate with a Regents Diploma. You may not like standardized tests, I don't hear too many people saying it's a bad idea to get kids to graduate with a Regents Diploma, as much as we need to improve that and what a Regents Diploma means. But, so these are very heavily, highly correlated with uh, uh, likelihood of graduate. But one theory about this, of course, is that the tests got easier, so of course people got better on the tests. And so another way that we always measure ourselves in New York City is to compare ourselves to the rest of the state taking the same tests. And what you see here at the bottom in the blue is the gap with the rest of the state. Um, and um, uh, what you see is that that gap is shrinking, shrunk by about 40% in ELA, 70% uh, uh, in math. Um, so that relative to all of the other kids in the state who are taking these tests, New York City students have performed uh, and improved uh, more. Now, another possible theory that this beauty is designed to get at is that maybe it's easier to gain at the low levels. That could be because of the way the tests are or just because you have further to go so there's no ceiling effect. So what we did on this um, uh, was to, New York City, as many of you know, is divided up into 32 administrative school districts. That's a state law. And so what we did was we compared those 32 districts to the nearest district in the state um, in terms of the starting average score of their students in 2002. And then the arrow measures what happened between 2002 and 2009. So this dot right here is Rochester, and that dot right there is Syracuse. Schools with all, uh, essentially like New York, the same proportions basically of poor and minority students. So the black dots are the next nearest school districts in the state. Like the red dots, the red dots are New York City community school districts. And what you see is at any level of starting point, whatever starting point level you choose, uh, New York City students did better compared to the next closest kind of district um, uh, demographically and by their outcomes uh, as of that point across the board. So something is happening in New York that's different what's ha than what's happening to the same types of kids in districts very similar on the same test. So it's not something about the test. Um, uh, uh, this is graduation. New York City has 
calculated its graduation rate the same way since 86. New York State started calculating its graduation rate in 2005. And what you see is whichever of these measures, something started happening in 2002 that caused a stable graduation rate around 50% going back uh, 15 years or more suddenly started to grow. And this is true on the New York State uh, measure. It's actually grown. The percentage of gain here is higher on the state gain, uh, uh, measure, even though it's a stricter uh, measure. Compare New York City, which is over here on the left, to the um, other kinds of districts, large city districts in the state, urban suburban districts, et cetera. And what you see is New York City graduation rate growing. Um, a lot of stability in graduation rates across the state. New York State's graduation rate is growing because New York City is about 35 to 40 percent of the state. So again, there's something happening in New York, started happening in 2002, um, that, that seems to be making some kind of a difference. So what is the New York City approach? This is the basic, um, you heard Joel talk about this, get really good leaders in schools and give them a lot of power to make their own decisions at the local school level. I like to say that when I was working for the New York City bureaucracy, if I came up with a really, really brilliant idea and said, let's put this into effect in all 1,500, 1,600 schools, and I really was brilliant, it would be good for half of the schools. And for the other half, it would be terrible. Or it would you know, move them in the other direction. Well, who's going to figure that out? And this is, I think, one of the messages from the charter schools. The people who are right there with the kids are going to figure it out because they just have more information about what those kids need. So what you want to do is to have the decisions made near the kids uh, and empower uh, principals to do this. So they need the freedom to decide. Um, they need control over their staffs and budgets. They need per capita funding so they get the funding they need so it should follow the kids. And it's not some crazy formula, but it follows the kids with some waiting for kids who present greater challenges. And then they need data, tools, training, and technology to enable them to find out what they can about their kids and to um, <coughs> identify instructional failure where it's occurring, instructional weakness where it's occurring, and cure it. You heard Caroline talk about one of the things um, charter schools do is they do a lot of data analysis on their kids. I'll talk some more about that. But it turns out, and New York knows all about decentralization, decentralization itself will not work because that's just a strategy for turning the schools over to all sorts of adult interests that are, have much greater chance to capture a school than they do to capture an entire bureaucracy. So most decentralization is a disaster because it is a way of giving adult interests of one sort or another control over schools. So you need accountability to make sure that there's an incentive on the part of those schools to move the kids forward. So it's all about the kids. It's children first, as the mayor named the reform here. Um, and so what I want to talk about particularly are two aspects of this. How do we create the accountability for that? And how do we give this fourth thing here, this big part of um, empowerment, which I call achievement resources, how do you give the principles, the data, the technology, and the other kinds of tools that they need in order to figure out child by child where instruction has failed them, if they're not doing as well as they can do, and what can you do um, about that. So let me talk a little bit about this. You saw a version of this in Joel's uh, presentation. Essentially on the, um, uh, this is accountability and achievement resources. That's what I named my division when I was here, when I was at the department. Um, essentially there are three steps here we think are crucial. Um, two of them are more on the accountability side. One is on the achievement resources side. You've got to evaluate. You've got to enforce consequences. And then you've got to enable. And so I want to talk about all of those things to some extent. First of all, let me talk a little bit about our scorecards, our progress reports. Joel talked about them. But I think we actually learned some things here that are really important. and. Um, they're going to insult some of the economists here, so you can maybe take heart from that, if nothing else. Um, but um, the first point is that what you're really trying to do with the system is motivate people to move kids forward. So there is this balance that we realized that we had between 
a structure that motivated people to move forward and a structure that was perfect at measurement. And guess what? It's much more important if you have to make that trade-off to get the performance <coughs> management right and create the incentives right, even if your, your measurement isn't perfect. If you can get perfect measurement, it's better because it motivates people better because they'll trust the system more. But it turns out that um, uh, you can't always do that. And a good example is regressions. Oops. We have a rule in New York City that we do not use regressions to measure people. Um, when I first came in, principals were given bonuses based on regressions, and I talked to them about it. And what they said was, some years manna fell from heaven, and I got a bonus. I had no idea what I did. I had no idea what they measured, but I got it. I was very happy. But the years that I didn't get it, I didn't care because I didn't know what it meant. So um, it didn't really have any effect on what they did. Maybe it rewarded them for doing well, so that's a good thing they'd stay in the system, but it did had no diagnostic capacity. So what we want is something that educators can actually recalculate themselves from scratch. We put the progress report out, and the first thing every principal in the city does is go through it, and they take all the data which we provide to them underneath every metric. They can add it up. They know exactly what the formulas are, and they're going to tell us how wrong we are. It's a little game we play with them. And it's really a wonderful game, because in the process of trying to find out what we did wrong, they find out what they did wrong. And very often they will find that 30 kids in their school made the difference between the grade they got and the grade above, because they didn't do well enough by those kids. So it's really important, but we give up something because we don't use a regression, which would be a little bit more perfect. Um, we want to, um, uh, skipping down here, um, we want to use criterion referenced nor, uh, 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 measures, not norm reference. What does that mean? Set a target, tell me what you want me to hit, and if I hit it, then I get my A. If I hit the next one, I get my B and all of that. That's why there's been some great inflation in New York, because they learned how to hit those targets faster and better than we thought they would, but it's much better than norm referenced. If you think that there's only a 15% chance that you'll get that A, no matter what you do, because everybody else is working just as hard as you. You're just not going to work as hard, the principals told us. And um, I think that is correct. What do you use to set your criteria? Well, here, what you do is you want to prove that it can be done. People will not go after a target if they don't think they can hit it. Um, and so you've got to prove to them that it is within their grasp. And how did we do that? Essentially, the way we set an A was we looked at the best schools like your school. New York City, lots of schools, so we could do this very well. The best schools like your schools in the last three years, what did they do? The top 15% of them. If you do as well as the top 15% of schools last year and the year before, you get an A. So um, uh, it's norm referenced in a sense that we're looking backwards to get um, that level, but then we set that target, and if, if, if more than 15% of it can hit that target, um, uh, good for them. Um, as Joel said, God bless them, and that's some of what we had happen. One of the things I didn't point out on those graphs, um, and maybe I can go back really quickly to this one. Notice the big jump in 2007 on both of these. 2007 was the year that the accountability and all of the rest of this system went into effect in full. And you see that the slope of the gains was improved at that point. So we think that had something to do with it. Um, so. Um, that's how we showed that they were realistic. We compare schools to schools like themselves as well as other schools so they know that they are um, uh, being uh, compared to something that they really can hit. We also created a real rule on our part that we wanted to generate outcomes. The proportion of A's, B's, etc. were not correlated very much. No more than 10% and at elementary middle less than 5% with Percent black, percent Hispanic, percent special ed, percent ELL, uh, and all of that. Um, because when I first came in, people said we have the no child left behind, and basically I ignore it. Why? Because the message it sends is, you want a better score? Get better kids. But that's exactly the wrong message. The message is, educate the kids that you do have and improve them. And so in order to do that, we don't want to have a skew in the outcomes based upon how good the kids are. How can you do that? Measure progress, measure growth, because growth actually is higher for kids at the lower performing level, so that helps you balance things out and give schools rewards for doing really well with the kids who were doing really poorly at the beginning. So those are ways that you can get away from having those. Um, so 
That is something about the um, uh, something about the accountability system. We also do qualitative measures um, uh, with our quality reviews, which I think are also very important. Essentially, what you want to do over time is you want to move from a system where there's a really stark external accountability system to a place where educators are holding each other accountable. And I think that's another attribute that you would probably find in good charter schools, where it's a professional community where they're holding each other accountable. They're very, uh, everything's transparent. They know who's, who's pushing the kids forward, who's not, and they're holding each other accountable. So that's where you want to go, but in the beginning, because of the way the culture in schools is, this culture of failure, of hiding, of obscuring everything, um, uh, of, of, of being atomistic and not wanting to share anything, you've got to create an external system at first, but then you want to slide over to one that over time has the educators holding each other accountable, and qualitative review is one way to start that process of transition uh, to a kind of peer review um, situation. But now what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of these enabling tools um, that we used. So one is the ARIS system uh, that Joel mentioned. This is just one of the many, many views that at the click of a button, um, real time, um, you can get to. This is a class, um, uh, um, a, a elementary school class, and this piece, oops, and these are all of the kids here in the class. Uh, these little icons tell you everything about those kids. Are they special ed, ELL, promotion of doubt? what grade there are. Here you have two years of uh, attendance data. We put this out for parents. The first time we put it out for parents, I found out that my son had taken off a few days before Christmas break uh, without telling us. <laughs> if you click on any one of these, you get the actual days that were missed. Um, and so you can see if they're clustering, it was they were sick, or it's actually spread out. Um, you also get here two years of state test data and the difference between the two is the kid making progress or not. And then right here we give periodic assessments that Joel mentioned. Every few months you get a new read on where the kids are. All of that shows up within five days. It's up on the system. And so you can compare all of your kids. You can sort it. You can drill down on any one of these metrics and find who the kids are um, and sort everything um, on that. So that's to get the data to the schools. That's very important. Um, what do we do with the data? So. The big theory here is that what you want educators to do, pretty much in teams, very transparently, um, is to identify how well kids are doing um, and to learn as much as you can about what it is about the kids who are not doing as well as they should be, um, and then try to hypothesize what might have caused that in terms of the instruction, um, and then do something about it. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about diagno diagnosis. What do I mean by diagnosis? We're not diagnosing kids. We're diagnosing instruction. That's why a lot of teachers and unions don't like it, because a doctor gets to diagnose the patient. doesn't have to diagnose himself, necessarily, or herself. The doctors are getting better at that. But what you're doing here is you're really diagnosing instruction. Um, and that's why it really should take place in teams, so that people can look uh, at what each other are doing and, and make it more comfortable to do all of that. So what this is, is just a representation of how we try to train teachers to be able to uh, do all of that. So now we started by having one of these inquiry teams in every school. Now we have about 60% in New York City of the teachers in the city are on at least one inquiry team, multiple inquiry teams in every school. And essentially what this is designed to do is to give an intensive one-year training in how to use data to diagnose and improve instruction, while at the same time actually helping a group of kids. So what the schools do is at the beginning of the year, they get their progress report, they look at the kids who are holding uh, them back because they didn't perform well, they try to find groups of those kids who seem to be similar to each other, they pick a sample of those kids, that's the target population, and they go through a rigorous facilitated, team-based approach to figuring out what it is that um, uh, identifies those kids vis-a-vis -vis the instruction they got that might tell you what you could do to change that instruction. Was it the teacher they had the year before? Was it the, the feeder school they came from? Gender, uh, it could be um, other kinds of statuses. Um, it could be found in the wrong answers that those kids give on their standardized tests. They all give the same wrong answer. They're, they've learned something wrong, so we need to figure out why when the other kids got the instruction and got it right, these kids are hearing it differently 
and getting it wrong. So lots and lots of data. The data we provide and lots more data that they come up with. And then essentially what they do is they come up with a hypothesis, they put into effect a new treatment, they set goals for that new treatment, they evaluate those goals periodically every few weeks, uh, they measure the kids that are moving forward. If a lot of kids are moving forward, they try to expand that um, strategy out to other kids. If some kids are not moving forward, you just start all over again, but now you have a lot more data that you're going to use to figure out why it was that some of those kids uh, didn't improve from the strategy, though others did. So that is a sense of what it takes to, and what the district is trying to do, dist uh, the, the Department of Ed here is trying to do um, with its schools. Um, what about, what I want to talk about to close here is just talk about what you need to do at Central and what you need to do in the intermediate structure in order to change. Because these changes will not occur if you take an old 1930s style bureaucracy, and that's what I found in some of the places, even when I got to the DOE in the second term of the mayor, you'd go into some offices and you'd see it. I had people on my team who calculated part of the graduation rate. They calculated their part. They did not know how to calculate the part before. They did not know how to calculate the part after. They did not know what to do when they knew that there was a big problem with the data they were using to calculate it. They just took it as a given and they just kept calculating it instead of saying, let's figure out a way to get that data better so I don't have to struggle with that. So there's a big problem in most big city central bureaucracies and in the intermediate structure. And so we know a lot less about this. The changes that were done at the DOE were much less thoughtful in the sense of modeling it and having pretty pictures and all sorts of things like that. Let me just say a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, this point here, um, don't est overestimate the cast capacity for self-transformation. Telling a division to change will not happen. You've got to, it's just like schools, telling a school to change will not happen. All of these changes are parallel at these different levels. So essentially I think it's important to create new groups from scratch, drawing people from both places, um, from outside and from inside the structure, um, uh, get them really good at it, make them people who are mostly these generalist problem solvers. Prioritize those problem solvers over domain experts. You can learn domain expertise. It's really hard to learn that culture change. You don't want to be running a change, a transformation with people who are going through that transformation. You want to run it with people who've gone through the transformation. So create new structures like that. Then absorb the old structure piecemeal into it. And what I did was I took those new little pieces and I distributed them right smack in the middle of the room, in these big rooms that we had at the DOE with, with open bullpens, right smack in the middle of my new group, I put the old group under new leadership and essentially to try to absorb the ethos. And I think there was some uh, value to that. Another point I'd make is be prepared to reorganize frequently. You think you want to reorganize to get the end state, but you're going to go through a big transformation what it takes to go through a transformation is different from what it takes to be in the end state. So be prepared for a big transformation. Uh, and that takes multiple reorganizations. Create expectations around that so people don't feel like um, everything's changing um, and the like. Um, there are parallel changes also that take place at the intermediate level. Um, the big thing here was to get rid of big intermediate structures, get rid of geographic distribution of those middle managers and change them from supervisors and superintending people to facilitators um, and to get the intermediate structures much closer to schools. So now schools are organized in groups of 25 schools, not gigantic districts or regions that are bigger than almost any other school system in the country, uh, but get them down to 25, let them self-select into that, select their own network leaders, um, and then give them this central role, dual accountability, accountable to the schools, or they get kicked out as the network leader, but accountable for the outcomes of their schools so that they can't just please the schools, they've also got to uh, move the schools forward. Um, the last point here is to say, to come back to the first one, which is just to say, I think the goal here is to be creating schools like this inside the system at the same time that we're proliferating um, uh, uh, charter schools and others like that outside the system and that's the point that perhaps we can get the transformations to move towards each other and come out the other end in a better place. 
Good morning. Good morning. That was sort of low energy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to deviate from past practice in two ways. One, I have no PowerPoint. And two, um, which I'm sure you're disappointed to hear. Um, and, and two, I'm going to question whether accountability is really sufficient to drive the kind of change we want. And I'm going to raise the question of whether we actually have overemphasized accountability in our conversation about education reform with an underemphasis on the tools that will allow the people who are accountable to actually do the things we want to hold them accountable for. So let me start with a couple of assumptions that the commissioner and I brought to our work uh, as we began seven months ago. One assumption is that our performance is really problematic at the state level. And it's problematic in two ways that are really important. One we focused on a lot today, which is the achievement gap. There's no question when you have a 70, 70 slightly over 70% uh, graduation rates statewide and compare that to 50% graduation rates in our cities around the state, that's a big problem. And then when you look at African American and Latino males and their graduation rates are in the 40s, and you look at English language learners and their graduation rates are in the 30s, that's a big problem. But there's a, a second problem that we also don't talk very much about, which is the kids who are graduating aren't really prepared. 75% of the freshmen in CUNY community colleges are in remedial courses. Those are kids with Regents diplomas. So even as, we, uh, even as we celebrate how getting a high three on your state test means you're likely to get a Regents diploma, that does not necessarily mean you won't find yourself in a remedial math class in freshman year of community college where you are literally doing fourth grade math. At great expense to you and to the federal government, and then when you drop out of college, your reward is a debt that you have to pay back and no economic opportunity. So we have to remind ourselves it's not just about gap closing, it's also about bar raising. The kids who are at the top of the spectrum, they also aren't being very well prepared. And that's not just true in our cities, that's true in our suburban communities as well. I think we are, we are at, great, at great peril as a country of losing our prosperity because of how dysfunctional our school systems are across the country. And so, if anything, we understate the scope of our challenge and our problem. That's one uh, very hopeful assumption uh, <laughs> with which um, the commissioner and I began our work. A second is that the solution to bad performance is performance management, but that performance management really has two components that are equally important. One is around accountability, identifying what's working and what's not working. But the second that matters, I think, equally is what do you do when stuff isn't working? What are the tools that you provide? What are the tr what's the training that you do? What are the, what, what's, the, what's the help that you give to the low performers to make them good performers? And that, I think, is a critical piece that's often missing in our conversation about education reform. A, a third assumption, also critical, is that what matters most, and I think this, this, this is played out in the research on teacher effectiveness, what matters most is the interaction between teacher and student. Everything else is interesting, but if it doesn't drive change in the interaction between teachers and students, then we're not getting at the essence of education. And so those three assumptions are the assumptions we brought to our work, and it's led us to, to an agenda that, that, I, that I want to lay out a little bit, and then I want to raise some other sort of depressing risk factors uh, for our work together. Uh, the, the three core elements that I, that I want to talk about that we focus on are to, sort of asking ourselves as a state, what are the levers that we have to drive improvement in teaching and learning? We've really settled on, on three main levers. One is around standards and assessment. Because the reality is, it matters a lot what target we set for our schools. We have standards, among our English language arts standards, we have phrases like, students will learn to uh, appreciate literature. Which, while a nice aspiration, is probably not terribly helpful to a fourth grade teacher in figuring out exactly what it is that they're supposed to teach in fourth grade. And so one of the things we've said is we've got to have better, higher, clearer standards. And so that's why we're participating in the Common Core Standards effort and very hopeful about the notion that we, along with the other 51 states and territories who are working on that, will be able to develop a set of Common Core Standards that truly lead students to success in college and careers. And that lay out in very specific terms exactly what it is that we expect students to be able to do and, and know at each grade level. Second, with those standards, we need assessments that measure college readiness. And we have to be honest with ourselves, 25 question 
bubble-in tests do not measure college readiness. So even if we had a home run and the kid gets the perfect score on the 25 multiple choice questions, that does not mean they are college ready. And, you know, as the, as the Secretary of Education has said, we're, we've been lying to ourselves in our last 10 years of education reform, greatly overstating the progress that we're making, even against these very depressing statistics that we've seen all morning. Because the reality is, we are not asking students to do the very things that would allow them to succeed in college. We are not asking them to write. We are not asking them to think critically. We are not asking them to explain how they solve the math problem. Not nearly as much as we need to, to be able to look at our test scores and say with confidence that they're an indicator of progress towards college and career readiness. So we need higher standards, and we need better assessments. Better, likely more expensive assessments. And that's why we've chosen to participate with a set of other states in a consortium that's applying for uh, what will be a $350 million uh, pool of federal money for the development of better college and career ready assessments. And we're advocating with our other states for assessments that are more comprehensive, more rigorous, and more performance based than the assessment regime that we have now. Multiple choice isn't bad, but it may be even necessary, but it is insufficient to measure what it is that we want to know about our students' abilities. It is also insufficient to simply do a once a year end of year measure. We know that formative assessment is critical, and we know that that is a missing tool in schools that aren't working, and a, a very important tool in schools that are working. And so we need those interim assessments, those formative assessments, and where schools and districts don't have the capacity to build them, we need to provide them. England is moving towards a system, I believe, where it's 60% of their uh, assessments will be summative and 40% uh, formative. That's the kind of thing we need to do with our resources. We need to deploy resources in a way that teachers actually have useful information in November and February about how their students are progressing, not just a post-mortem in July or August about what went wrong last year. Right? And then we need to build a bridge between those standards and assessments. And that bridge is curriculum. And that's not a conversation that many people have. But we, we, the commission and I have talked a lot about this notion that there are some things we know about what good content is to put in front of students. And it shouldn't be the case that if you move between schools a couple times in your education in New York State, that you get volcanoes three times, although you're very likely never to see volcanoes, right? And you learn nothing about electricity. That shouldn't be possible, because electricity you probably engage with a little bit more than volcanoes on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And so we ought to have a, not only a set of standards, but a curriculum, a real scope and sequence that lays out, again, what students need to know and be able to do at each grade level and what rigor looks like. What is a rigorous seventh grade science experiment? And that should be clear to all of our seventh grade science teachers. We're never going to get to where France is, you know, every 11 year old turning to page 11 at 11 o'clock on November 11th. We don't expect that, but we do expect a much, much clearer sense of what it is that teachers need to accomplish. And we know that states that are making larger gains on national assessments like the NAEP have that much clearer guidance. Massachusetts provides much clearer guidance than the, than the New York State curriculum frameworks do. And we know that that will translate into academic gains. And we want to be aggressive about it. We even are prepared to go to the level of, here's a list of 30 books, 30 books that would be really good for sixth graders to read. You don't have to read all 30 of them, but you know what? Five of those 30 are going to be on the state test, and so you better have read at least five. Right? We ought to be able to agree on that. And if we can't agree on that, then we ought to have a public conversation about what good literature is and what it is that we expect sixth graders to be able to read. So that's, that's one set of work around standards and assessments. The second set of work is very closely connected to what Jim described. You know, where New York City is on data is light years ahead of where most of the state is on data. We have a lot of work to build a data system that is comprehensive and statewide that does the kinds of things that ARIS can do. And we think of the data work in really two sets. One is a P20 longitudinal data system that helps us track students as they progress from pre-K all the way through college into the workforce. We ought to be able to answer questions like, is your performance on a math regents exam a good or bad predictor of how you will do in a freshman year math class? We don't know the answer to that question now. And New York City is moving to that through a partnership with CUNY, and our intention is to do, try to do that statewide through a partnership with CUNY and SUNY so we can understand much better the relationship between students' K-12 experiences and their higher ed experiences. We also shouldn't have the situation which we do now where students who are in OCFS facilities, that is students who are in, um, in uh, 
who got into trouble with the law, when they arrive at those facilities, someone asks them, you know, what courses have you taken? And the kid says, ah, I think I took ninth grade English. Ah, maybe I was in 10th grade math. I think I took one regents once. And then that person calls someone at a, at a school, often three or four or five schools that that child has attended, and asks them to fax them paperwork to see what courses and exams that child has passed. Absurd. Right? And so we need to make a large investment in the P20 longitudinal data system that has unique student identifiers for every student and then tracks what courses they take through unique course identifiers and what teachers they've had through unique teacher identifiers. And we need to be able to connect that information. And then I know Jonah will do incredible <laughs> informative research with all, of that, with, uh, with all of that data. And I know he'll make sure that we write into every statute that, that data element. And I appreciate that because we, we need... We need, with every education reform we undertake, we ought to be building in how we're going to evaluate whether or not it's working. The other piece of the data work is exactly what Jim was describing, the capacity of ARIS to be a tool for teachers to, uh, as an instructional reporting system, something that teachers use to do analysis of that formative assessment data in November and February. And not only to analyze, hmm, who, who got the fractions questions, the adding fractions questions right in my class, who got them wrong. But then to know, what happened in the other classes in my building? Did someone else do a better job with adding fractions? And can I go and see their class? What else happened in the schools around me? Is there another school that's just hitting the ball out of the park and adding fractions? Because I better go learn what they're doing. And, and New York City is beginning to build that. The rest of the state has a distance to travel in, in most of our districts. And so that's, that's a big investment we want to make around data. So that's a, that's a second set of work. The third set of work, which really goes to a lot of the conversation today, is around teacher effectiveness and principal effectiveness. And it starts with teacher preparation. I, I don't think that a 80% churn rate is, is realistic. Not, and for two reasons. One, because I think um, there's a ton of costs associated with that and sort of political challenges, which, you know, and I, I know Doug would acknowledge all that. But two, in a lot of our state, in the other 699 districts, Teachers are pretty much who they're going to be. You know, out in the rural, you know, the western rural parts of the state, um, those teachers mostly grew up in the town, and and they went to the school, and they're teaching in the school that they went to, and we're not going to have churn with all, where we replace those teachers with newly minted. Uh, even even TFA has tried to do some rural uh, recruitment. It's unlikely that we're going to have a, an endless supply of newly minted teachers for those communities, and so preparation. We think matters a lot, and we need to do a much better job of it. Well, we need better data. If you're, if you're an ed school professor right now, and you're teaching an ed school class in math, you're preparing math teachers, and let's say you were curious about, I don't know, whether or not the students you taught actually were good at teaching math. For some reason, you just thought to yourself, huh, I wonder if the students I've taught for the last 15 years actually succeed in teaching their kids math. You could not answer that question. We don't collect that data. We don't link teacher data back to the institutions that train them. And in the absence of that information, how can you make your training of math teachers better? How can you even know if what you're doing is working in any way? Right? And so what part of it is about, is about data. Part of it is about making the experience much more clinical. If we know that teachers get much better over the early part of their career, why aren't we having them as part of their preparation spend more time in schools with kids and teachers, especially master teachers, who can help them learn their practice? Similarly, around teacher preparation, why do we think that the institutions that have had a 130-year monopoly on teacher training are the only institutions that can do teacher training? Given the results, I think there's some question about that. It's not to say that there aren't some excellent teacher training institutions, but there are also some terrible ones. That's not surprising, but we don't measure it, so we don't know which are which. So one, we ought to measure it, but then two, we ought to ask, are there schools, some of these schools that we were just talking about, schools where they're getting great results, especially with teachers early in their career, are they, have they learned some things about how to t prepare teachers more quickly and more effectively, and oughtn't we ask them to do more of that? Joel talked this morning about having schools in the district that have much better success rates for English language learners. I think our English language learner graduation rate last year was 38%. And think about what that means, that 62% of the kids I have the life chances that one has if you don't go to high school. So if there are schools that have much better graduation rates for English language learners, we should figure out what they're doing, and then we should ask them to help us train teachers 
of English language learners where we have a huge shortage. And so one of the things that we've said at, with great controversy, and now higher ed institutions aren't happy with us, but we've said we ought to have non-higher ed institutions have the ability to prepare and certify teachers in New York State. And so that, that's our intention, and, and that's our intention, we're moving forward with that. Because we think we've got to get much better at teacher preparation. We've got to change, we've got to change what Doug found. We've got to change that data. We've got to have a larger share of new teachers actually prepared to succeed in their classrooms, and we think we can do that. Um, and one additional point on that around the commissioner's work at Hunter and Teacher U, which was referenced earlier. One of the powerful things at Teacher U, uh, not only leveraging the best practices of high performing charters, but the use of video I, and as, a, as a, just a type of technology for training, I think is incredibly powerful. And it's use of video in two ways. One, using video to show best practice. To say to that, teach, that rookie teacher, you may have no idea what you're going to do on the first day of school, just do this. Just do what's in the video. <laughs> Trust me, just do what's in the video. And what we, what we saw at Uncommon Schools is that just doing what was in the video actually was much better than what most rookie teachers would have done in the absence of the video. <laughs> Truthfully. And so what you could see is, you know, very much like sports, right? I mean, part of how one becomes a great athlete early on in your learning of the sport, you're, you're not, you know, you're not just born knowing how to hit the baseball. You're, you watch someone do it and you try and do what they did. And then eventually that translates into, you know, becoming an outside genius. But that's not how you start out, right? So that's one use of video. But the other use of video that's powerful is, if, if, especially if your students are having clinical experiences, they are actually in schools teaching students, is rather than send folks home, as my professors did at Teachers College, you know, with the assignment of write a 20-page lesson plan about X subject, which you would never actually do, because who's writing a 20-page lesson plan every night as a teacher? Um, rather than do that, you give people a flip camera, which costs hardly anything, and you say, here's what we talked about, about how to teach the adding of fractions. You go do it in your classroom, you videotape it, you turn that into me, I'll watch the video and I'll give you feedback on it. And that's so that you can see how that dramatically shifts what the professor is able to contribute to the student through the use of technology. So there's a lot we think we can do to make teacher preparation better. But then we ought to build our certification system around what we learn about what makes for effective early career teachers. So one, to get your initial certification, we ought to ask, you know, are you able to do the things that teachers need to do? Like, can you look at a set of student data? You know, if you're a prospective math teacher, can you look at a, student, a set of student data, disaggregate it, analyze it, and tell us how you would tell your instruction to those students based on that data? Because that's a skill, the first time you give a quiz, you, you're going to need to be able to do that. We ought to assess that through our initial certification. Rather than just looking at seat time requirements and whether you took a course with a particular title. And then when you get your professional certification, your lifetime license from the state to teach, we ought to see, can you actually teach? Right? And so one of the things that we've said and the, and the regents, our State Board of Regents has approved is that we will use student achievement data as part of how we do permanent certification. So you will not get your lifetime license to teach unless you demonstrate value-added gains for the students that you have taught early in your career. So it's really taking the research that Doug and Jonah were talking about and translating that into policy. So there's improving teacher preparation, but most of our teachers are already in school. So we figure if we imp dramatically improve teacher preparation, transform it totally, it will take 40 years uh, to change the teaching force. So that can't be our only strategy. Uh, so the other strategy is around evaluation and support. And I, and I think both, again, both are equally important. On evaluation, we need to use the value-added data. We need to train principals how to observe teachers, what it is exactly they're supposed to look for when they're in a teacher's classroom. And we need to have a system that has multiple measures that helps us evaluate teacher performance. And we need to not have just a binary system of satisfactory and unsatisfactory, especially now when it's 98.2. And that maybe is a little bit generous. I think I suspect it might be more 99.9 uh, and 0.1. But what we've said and, and what we are going to require goes into teacher contracts, beginning, next, beginning with new contracts set next year, is the use of four categories, ineffective, developing, effective, and highly effective, so that we can begin to differentiate performance and professional development and support. 
We've also said at the beginning of, next, beginning of contracts that are, that are agreed to next year, student achievement data needs to be a part of teacher evaluations. And we're in conversations with stakeholders now as we prepare for our Race to the Top Round 2 application about trying to put more teeth to that and more meat on those bones and to think about what's a reasonable, uh, what's a reasonable weight, for example, for student achievement data. So once you build that in and you have this better evaluation, the question remains, so if the person gets a bad evaluation, then what happens? And yes, the people who are rated ineffective and don't make progress with support, they ought to be removed. But again, if we go back to the western part of the state or some of our small cities, the teachers are kind of who they are. You can't have 20% turnover and just replace those people. So then the question becomes, if people are rated towards the bottom, ineffective or developing, do we have something we can give them? Can we help them get better? And that's where I think research is so critical. We just don't have good answers now. We've got to take stuff like Doug Lamont's taxonomy that was profiled in the New York Times, and we've got to research and we've got to figure out, can we, can we demonstrate with some certainty that that's the right set of strategies? And then can we teach teachers those strategies so they move from ineffective to developing to effective? Because truthfully, if we don't learn how to move teachers up in performance, we, have a, we cannot solve our education performance problem. We just can't. There just aren't enough new teachers, especially when you move outside of our large northeastern cities. And so we think there's a lot of work to do around professional development and teacher support and figuring out how we help teachers to get better. And part of that will be once you identify those, those highly effective teachers, how do you leverage them to help their colleagues, either as mentors, as observers, as models? You know, what is it that, well, how do we use those teachers, those superstars, once we know who they are, how do we use them to drive them so those, those three core strategies, standards and assessments, data, and great teachers and leaders, because we've got to do exactly the same thing for our leaders as we do for our teachers. We've got to evaluate them on student performance. We've got to figure out actually how to train leaders effectively. Uh, I would say too often uh, training programs for principals are essentially credit accumulation programs because the way our salary structure is structured, uh, teachers make more if they accumulate credits. and so. In many principal training programs around the city, half the people in the room have no intention of being principals. They are there to accumulate their credits towards their plus 30. Right? That can't be a good thing for a classroom conversation about leadership. Right? So there's a, there's a lot of work to do on, on those three areas, and there's a lot of risk ahead of us. So let me end with, with some more bleak, uh, bleak news. One risk is that, to return to where I began, we've been lying to ourselves. I do not think we as a society, as a state, as a city, realize how bad the problem is. The fact of the matter is that a three on our state test isn't good enough to be on track for college readiness. And so we're going through a process now to try and look at how our cut scores have been done uh, and to reevaluate how cut scores are set on New York State exams, not only three through eight, but also Regents exams, and look at can we set the cut scores in a way that links to actual college readiness so that we're not lying to ourselves, and we're still lying to kids about their level of preparation. It also means that we've got to look at those graduation rates and ask ourselves, it's good that we're making good progress on those graduation rates, but are those kids graduating prepared for, for something real afterwards? Are they prepared for college or careers? And if not, then we've got to look back at how we do high school and ask what we do in high school in the right way. Are our seat time requirements that we've had for 100 years, are they the right Requirements that the right way to think about how we prepare our teenagers for life. So there's a lot of a lot of questions that come from acknowledging the reality of how dire our performance is. A second problem we have to be honest with ourselves about is that we have an environment, a low trust environment. And you know, having come from the charter sector and gone to Albany, where there's a lot of conversation about charters and a lot of intensity uh, to the conversation about charters. One of the things that I'm struck by is how little of the conversation is about schools and the substance of what matters for student learning and how much of the conversation is about politics, and that is on both sides. And so how do we turn that highly politicized, low trust conversation into a conversation about what works for kids? How do we sort of lower the heat level on the conversation and raise the light level on the conversation? Um, part of how we do that is we have to be honest in the Ed Reform Movement about the things we don't have good answers to. I mean, you know, I, I have a number of friends who are doing, I think, really important work in New Orleans, 
where the charter sector is the system. And they're having to grapple with questions that, frankly, the rest of the charter sector across the country hasn't really grappled with. What do we do with really high needs special ed kids if we're the system? Right? And we have, what do we do with schools that have huge concentrations of English language learners? You know, and it can't be enough to say, well, those are bad schools. Yes, their performance is bad, but then what are we going to do to make their performance better? And yes, if they have fewer English language learners, their performance group may be better. But that's not the same as figuring out how we help English language learners prepare to graduate. And we shouldn't pretend that, that we in the reform sector have figured out the answer to that. We haven't. And so we've got to be a lot more honest, I think, about the questions that we're grappling with, the things we're having a hard time with. And we've got to be, and we've got to be realistic about, about how we talk about teacher effectiveness and teacher evaluation and realize that it can't be just about gotcha. That is not going to build trust, and that, is, and that is never going to be the way that we move forward in the vast majority of our 700 districts. Just firing the bottom whatever percentage is not sufficient to get to excellence for all students. And there may, you know, there's some interesting research about how letting go of your bottom performance does drive performance gains. But it's not enough to just have marginal gains. We want an excellent education for every kid. And so we've got to have a broader strategy than that. A, a third problem we have is how little we know about what works in schools and classrooms, and how little we've invested in figuring out what works in schools and classrooms. In the absence of that knowledge, it's very hard to, to move our system forward. And we've got to be much more systematic. And the way that folks have talked about all morning, much more systematic about trying to identify and define best practice in a way that it can be then shared, disseminated, and replicated efficiently. So um, we have a lot of work to do, uh, that commission and I. Uh, we also happen to have chosen to arrive during the worst fiscal crisis in the United States since the Great Depression, uh, which is not very helpful. Um, but we also have an extraordinary opportunity. The federal government is investing more in education than it ever has before. There's an incredible amount of resources available. Private philanthropy in education is, a, is at an incredible level. We must not lose this moment. And so it's incredibly urgent that we not only, just to close on the theme, not only focus on accountability, but focus on the tools and resources that are going to help the people who are accountable do the things we want them to do. So, Questions? <clears throat> Ready for lunch? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, in neither talk was there any discussion about any responsibility that would be pushed back to the parents mm -hmm. or any or any expectational change on the part of the parents or implicit contract with the parents in terms of what the school expects out of them. And I was just curious as to your thought, both of you, your thoughts mm -hmm. on that. Well, I think that's very important. Um, I think that the place where it happens uh, and where it works is at the school. I think if there is a single model, if we tried to say for all of New York City, do it this way, interact with your parents in that way, it would be a disaster because each school faces a different set of challenges um, in that way. And so I think part of the empowerment strategy is to sort of figure out how to get the most out of the parents. We created, as part of ARIS, ARIS Parent Link, so that every single parent in the city um, using their kid's ID number can get and see every bit of data that the city has, they can see. Um, and we started a process, um, the financial situation has, has put it somewhat what of a damper on this, but I think a very big new frontier is to create new forms of parent-teacher conference. Um, I have two kids in the New York City system. Uh, one of them is always well uh, behaved, and so I have nothing to talk to those teachers about. And the other one is every once in a while not so well behaved, so sometimes I have something to talk, but that's it. Um, and it's five minutes, and it's, you know, go away. I, I, you know, I don't have time, and, and, um, and there's no base to talk about it. So I think there's a real process there. But one thing I do want to say about this, I don't, it's very important, but we live in a culture of excuses, and I just worry about things that essentially start to say, 
well, we can't do it in the schools because it's the parents or it's other things like that. And I think that the first thing, first and foremost, is to take the responsibility for what we can do. Um, and then once we do that, we'll realize that parents are really crucial to it and we'll find ways to use them. But if we start from the perspective that it's really all about the parents, I think that's the strategy for kind of staying where we are because it takes away some of the responsibility. A couple thoughts on that. One is I think we have a huge research problem on this issue. You know, the, the study that's always used in every workshop, uh, ed school conversation I've ever been a part of about parent engagement is, you know, high parent involvement correlates with student success, which is interest, an interesting observation, but not terribly actionable. And so we've got a big question about what is it that a school should do to actually effectively engage parents in their kids' academics. My hypothesis is that bake sales are, are less effective than engaging families in the academic curriculum of the school. One of the things we would do at Uncommon Schools is we would have a math night where we'd have pizza and we'd play math games with parents and kids together because the kids would nag the parents to come to math night if they knew they were gonna get to hang out with their friends and have pizza and soda. And uh, uh, we probably should have healthier food, uh, but nonetheless. Uh, and, but having the parents there and engage with their kids around math, some of those parents then went back and actually played shoots and ladders with their kids, which I suspect did help their math performance. And some of those parents now understood what their kids were doing in math and they didn't before, which I suspect helped their kids' math performance. But I don't know that to be true, and we don't have a systematic way that we're researching that, so I think we have a research gap. We also have a training gap. Most new teachers have never had a conversation in their preparation about parents at all. Uh, one of the things we started doing at Uncommon Schools was we would role play conversations with parents during the summer before uh, teachers would begin because most of our teachers, again, had never had a conversation about what that would be like. And so for many first year teachers, their first time having a difficult conversation with a parent or even thinking about what that looks like is when they're sitting across from that parent talking about the misbehavior or the bad report card. And so what we were trying to do through role plays uh, is try and help teachers be prepared for those interactions. And I don't think teacher ed institutions are doing a very good job on that front. Loss? Um, actually, for both of you, um, I was, it was very exciting to hear about the, the, what you laid out as the vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And I was wondering, uh, I'll reflect on each of you about the distance between what you laid out as what you want to do and what it's going to take to get there. Mm -hmm. And for Jim in particular, I was interested in those inquiry teams in the schools um, that uh, I thought to myself, hmm, I haven't heard schools talking about these inquiry teams very much. And, uh, and they match very much some of the things that we do. And I'm wondering uh, both sort of how, how you see that, I mean, how far that's rolled out, what the supports mm -hmm. are for rolling it out across mm -hmm. the system. Well, I'll start. It's a good, good question. Um, the inquiry teams were started as one in a school, as a sort of proof of concept and to create a set of champions. Uh, this year is the first year where there's been an uh, aspiration, a goal to get it to 90%. Um, I understand that they've reached about 60% as of now, and there are more and more being added. So this is the year when that proliferation is taking place, and it's essentially part of a campaign as opposed to some things that were happening in schools. Um, a lot of the schools have focused mostly on literacy and math, and so science teachers aren't doing so much of this, and art teachers and other people like that, um, and that needs to change, and it is starting uh, to change, so those are places where um, uh, it, um, you know, it, it has been slow to reach. But the goal is to get it to 90% um, this year and next, and a lot of the changes that John talked about, new curriculum, new standards, all of a sudden you're going to have to <coughs> introduce the entire system to this whole new, exciting, important work. How are you going to do that? Well, the, te the inquiry teams are going to be the structure through that's the way that's going to happen in New York City, if I understand it right. Mm -hmm. There's two, th two things I'd say that I see as big obstacles. One is resources, frankly. I mean, the state's broke. Um, state education department is more than broke. We have a huge deficit. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of why states are so motiva motivated around race to the top, to be honest, is because states are desperate for resources. And I think if the uh, feds move forward with the president's vision for ESEA, there's lots of competitive grants. There's going to be lots of competitive interest in those grants across states because resources are just in dire need. And whether it's assessments or the data system, all of those things have real costs. And so one route is federal resources, and the other is persuading our fellow citizens about the value of those investments. And I don't think, honestly, that 
we as um, an education community, certainly not as ed reformers, have done a very good job on the persuasion of our fellow citizens front. Uh, and I think we've got to tell people, this is why an investment in data system, and people's eyes glaze over as soon as you say data system, but this is why an investment in data system matters. And I spent a lot of time in, in the state capitol uh, trying to inform our legislators about some of these issues. And I do think, for one, they're surprised because historically the education department and educators generally don't reach out to them that much except about sort of narrow vested interest advocacy. But two, I think people are persuadable. You know, when you start to talk about what a data system actually means, what the inquiry groups do, what an electronic transcript would mean for kids, people get it and they get bought in. Uh, and so I do think there's work that we can do around persuasion. And then more broadly, I'd say a big obstacle, I have to say, is leadership. And it's a particular kind of leadership. And, you know, I think what's powerful about the quotation that, that Joel shared this morning, or one of the things that's powerful to me about it, is that Martin Luther King saw the value of standing on conscience, but also of persuading other people to stand with him. It wasn't enough it wasn't just about principled on the side saying all you all are just wrong and I get to be right, but it was let's have a conversation about what right is and can I persuade you. And that kind of leadership, we have a huge dearth in our state uh, and nationally and I, I think we have to have that kind of conversation about education reform that isn't about just saying uh, we're going to beat up on each other about you know, your vested interests, no, you are, your profiteer, no, you are, uh, which plays out a lot in, the, in our newspapers, but really have a conversation about what would be good for kids and, and really persuade people to move them. Other questions? I, I have a question for each of you. Um, so my, my question for, for John, uh, first of all, I, I really enjoyed both of your presentations and um, they're very inspirational. Um, but my question for John is, there's a theme, you know, in the teacher effectiveness literature now that suggests that we can figure out who effective teachers are ex post, but we can't figure out who they are ex ante, and maybe we can't figure out how to transform the ineffectiveness, the ineffective ones into effective ones. You talked about videotaping and the importance of, of that, and I, I guess I wanted to ask you about a potentially promising policy. Uh, there's some recent research by Clement Jackson from Cornell that suggests that if you have an effective teacher who has proven to be effective in the past based on her value added, and you drop her into uh, another school, that she actually changes the teachers around her and makes them more effective. Now, we don't know why. We don't even necessarily know why she was effective in the first place, but something mm -hmm. that she's doing is is helping to change those other teachers. Now, there are only a certain number of effective teachers, so you can't go dropping them into every school and having this work. But it does make one wonder whether videos are a potential way to spread your relatively effective teachers over a larger pool of schools so that you're not, you know, you're not saying only 15% or 10% of teachers can be exposed to an effective, a very effective colleague, even if we don't know what makes them. So that's my question for John. And then my question for Jim is, you had this beautiful figure at the end of your presentation that had the transformed public schools basically in the middle of a circle. And then it had a little ring of charter schools around the outside. And I think everyone is very interested in the proportion that's going to be inside the circle and outside in that little ring of, of charter schools. I also work on higher education, so I always have this I always have this sense that we ought to pay more attention to higher education in the US because our higher education system is actually very effective. It's the envy of the world. It's not perfect, but nobody really argues that it's an ineffective system. In our higher education system, we have about 30% of the students being educated by private colleges and universities. We might think of them as being more like the charter schools, and we have about 70% being educated by public colleges and universities, which are much more effective, accountable, et cetera, than our public K-12 schools probably. Is that 70, 30% the right sort of number? Or is that something that's going to work in higher education but is completely wrong in K-12 education? I, I, I'd just like your thoughts on those two things. You want to start? Uh, sure. Well, why don't you start with the second one? 
<laughs> I'm gonna think about the first one. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. First of all, I wanna complicate it because I, in the diagram, which I haven't been able to get back, there was one school that was like straddling the border and you couldn't tell which it is. And I actually think, and, and one of the things about New York City charter schools that may contribute to them doing well, you, you mentioned it, is that they are public charters in more of a sense than a lot of charters elsewhere, even if they're all in some sense certified um, by the state in one sense or another. And I actually think that where New York really may end up going is by having networks of schools that are in all sorts of configurations that are straddling a public-private line that is going to kind of go away and we're not really going to recognize it. And that's why I drew the, there was a system around all of it. Um, but in terms of what the mix is, I think it's a very interesting question, and 7030 doesn't sound crazy to me. Um, I think that you do need to get, and one of the points you made about New York City is having a lot of charters, relatively speaking. I do think you need a critical mass, otherwise there will <coughs> not be the competition and the sense of threat, um, the, the, the sense that something else is going on over there that really bears um, paying attention to. So I think that, um, you know, a substantial, I don't think we're there yet with charters in, in, in the sense that we've got enough and um, uh, we ought to go from there. We're not anywhere close to where we could be um, uh, to keep pushing the system. One of the points I didn't make but I wanted to is I think charters have really pushed. We wouldn't have thought this. The first thing that I did when I got to the DOE was go tour some uncommon schools and some achievement first and some of the other charters. Um, and you know, I don't think it's about the, um, the, the, the uniforms. I think it's something else. And that's what, you know, we really wanted to emulate and, and we're, you know, trying. So I do think that that, that very prominent example um, uh, that's always there and potentially expanding. And I think you also wouldn't want to say 70-30. You'd want to say, let's let it figure itself out because if more people want to keep going into the charters, well, maybe that tells us. Tells us. Um, so on the question of sort of teacher peer effects, two, two things. One, one is I think you're exactly right about the power of video. And, and certainly what we did at Uncommon Schools was as we, as we grew to scale, we had more and more <coughs> early career teachers. Uh, and we knew we needed to find a way to get them better faster. And video became that because we could use video of our most effective teachers as a tool for training the new teachers. An interesting idea that Joel has, which, which I think is worth exploring, I don't know if he's right, but, but it's an interesting hypothesis, which is that if he could do what the New York City Police Department could do, he would get better results. And that is to say, when there's an uptick in crime in the South Bronx, they move star police officers from central Brooklyn to the South Bronx to fix the problem. And Joel has raised this question of, well, when you've got air pockets of low performance, should you be able to move high-performing teachers to those areas? Uh, I think it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question whether you can incentivize that, if you could mandate that, if you could have a cadre of highly effective teachers. That's, that was their role, was to go and sort of, uh, and teams to schools to drive change. I'd love for someone to undertake that and then to have Jonah research it, or Doug, or both, uh, from the beginning. Um, but, but I think it'd be really it's a really interesting set of questions. Thank you very much.